Joe Biden is an elderly man with a poor memory. I know it, you know it, we all know it, but make sure the left knows it too by picking up a mug or a t-shirt at studosmerch.com. The code is stu10, get 10% off. Be sure to check out the show on YouTube as well, youtube.com slash America, and uh, like and comment on our videos. We would love if you clicked the bell for notifications and followed the show as well. Brandon Morris is here. He's going to tell us why conservatives need to embrace video games and pay attention to the video game industry. I've got the latest on the Moscow terror attack. But we start by doing the real attack on democracy. You know, we've been told over and over again we've got one savior, one, one defender of all of us in our democracies, the the self-appointed saviors of our democracy are the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party is there to prevent any of these intrusions into our, our important democracy. And, of course, we are a democracy, as you know. Now, of course, we're not. We're a constitutional republic that does have elements of democracy, important elements inside of it. And so it is important to defend those aspects of democracy that we do hold dear. Uh, voting, making sure we get proper election results, really key. It's odd that the left is always fighting against those things. Um, they are always fighting against uh, anything you do to, like, I don't know, verify someone's identity when they go to the polls. Like, I, how can you be pro-democracy if you're, if you're doing that? Whole other story, I suppose. But what I was really thinking about today is, is January 6th really the real threat on democracy? Was there ever a moment that you thought, hey, maybe the presidential election is going to get overturned by this guy in the horn hat as he's sitting or someone with their feet up on Nancy Pelosi's desk? Was there ever a risk to you? Did you ever think, oh, gosh, whole country is falling apart? Now, it was a bad day. As I pointed out, I did, I did not like what happened on January 6th at all. I don't like violence against police officers. I don't like people rioting. But that's what it was. It was a riot. There was no chance of our democracy being overthrown that day. And I think everybody kind of knows that in their hearts. They all knew that a few hours later, everything went on as normal. Should they have waited for hours? No, it shouldn't have, shouldn't have happened. But let's not call it the Civil War Part Two, as they, as they were doing at the time, the worst thing since the Civil War. It really wasn't that. And you think about this group of people that are telling you that they are defending democracy. What are they actually doing with their time? Has anyone noticed can we go through the democratic plan for democracy here for a second? Step one is, you know, jail and bankrupt your opponent, uh, Donald Trump. They want to jail him. They want him kicked off the ballots and they want him completely bankrupted personally. In fact, there was tons and tons of glee about this prospect all day today because, of course, it was a big day in this particular case. We're going to get this big ruling on whether Donald Trump has to pay four hundred and sixty four million dollars. And that could wipe him out. Everyone was excited about this on the left. Well, I have terrible news for you. If you happen to be on the left and haven't been watching the news the past few hours, an appellate court has ruled that Trump can po post a lower bond of only $175 million to cover his civil fraud judgment. Now, I, it was amazing to see the absolute glee on the left leading up to this announcement and the immediate jam on the emergency brake, throw the car in reverse, and now everything is lost, and it, it, was a, it was tears and crying, and it was just an absolute despondence that you have to take real pleasure in watching. I will say, however, $175 million for this is still completely nuts. I mean, it, it's still wildly excessive, and if you go back and watch our show, I don't remember when it was, maybe we can get the name of the show for you, but it was the show where we went through how this particular law that Donald Trump is being hit with in New York has been utilized in the past. There is no equivalent to what's happening to Donald Trump now, no equivalent. Nothing throughout his the history of this law. It's never been used this way to this degree, ever. It's not even close. Nothing, nothing remotely comes even close to it. It's an obvious per political persecution. Anyone watching it knows that if they're being honest with themselves. Now, I will say, I did turn on CNN today. And you might say, why do you keep banging your head against that spike-filled wall? And I understand that's true. But I watch it so you don't have to. Um, and I was watching it, and they came out, and Donald Trump was making his kind of typical speech. Oh, you know, the courts are corrupt. I'm being targeted. This is election interference. Biden and his cronies are coming after me. You know, the, the stuff you've heard him say a hundred times. And they come out of it and they're like, for, first of all, they didn't let him finish. They cut, they cut him in half uh, as he cut his speech in half. And they came out and they said, oh, we just want to make sure we're clear that uh, there are tons and tons of falsehoods there. Let's bring in our fact checker, uh, Daniel Dale. Daniel, what did you think was going on? Oh, well, we should point out there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that Anyone is targeting Trump like this, that the, the Biden administration uh, wants him to be removed. And it's like, uh, can we look, can we at least be real with ourselves for a second? 
everybody knows they have a massive political interest in hurting Donald Trump here. And no, they don't oversee every aspect of the case. No, they don't micromanage every case uh, in, in each direction, though I'm sure there's influence behind the scenes. But like, let's be honest about it. Of course they want this to happen. Of course they do. They're trying to get this guy thrown off the ballot. They're trying to personally bankrupt him. And they are trying to throw him in prison. All these things are happening with officials either directly from uh, this or past White Houses or people who aspire to get into future ones. These are all people that are aligned with the same political ideology doing these things over and over and over again for the most part. There are some exceptions to that here and there, but generally speaking, it's obvious and true to any onlooker what they're trying to do. And they know that if they can throw Donald Trump in prison and he's trying to win the election from behind bars, it's going to be really hard. It's going to be really hard to do so. So this is their goal. Will it work? I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, it it may work. It might not. I mean, the polls are closer than than you think. I mean, the average poll right now is one point apart. One. The average poll nationally is a one point advantage. Now, Donald Trump has a wider advantage than that in swing states through the Electoral College, which, of course, is what actually matters. The national polls mean nothing except to just give you a general sense of the race. But this election is close and could go either way. Uh, So they're going to do everything they can to try to make that happen. And we will see if it works. Now, obviously, I think there is a risk for them just like grabbing Trump Tower or grabbing his assets because that is uh, something that could really backfire. Of course, AOC wants you to know not taking them might backfire as well. Ocasio-Cortez says there is a risk to not seizing all of his assets, which is fascinating. Now, of course, Donald Trump is out there trying to say, Well, let's delay this. I want to push this as late as possible. The later he can push it, the the better for him, of course. The judge has not uh, sided with him on that one. Judge sets Trump hush money trial for April 15th, rejecting a further delay. But you see what they're trying to do here. The the tactic is quite clear. Take out your opponent. Uh, That's what they're trying to do. Plain and simple. You know, and they are it may work. Uh, They've Got a lot of friendly people in friendly districts uh, where people vote 70 and 80 percent for Joe Biden. And maybe it'll work. I don't know. It's going to be very, very uh, interesting to watch at the very least. Now, that's just part of their election strategy. But again, remember, they are the party of democracy. And somehow they believe this party of democracy is best illustrated by giving you a ballot with one name on it. And that is, I don't know, not really democracy to me. We showed this on radio today. Back in the day, in the 30s, uh, we have a, a, a authentic Hitler ballot. And it just says Adolf Hitler. And then a big circle where you can put your X in the middle of it. Because he was the only guy. And it seems like that's the, uh, I don't know, the exact approach of the Democratic Party right now. They want one name on the ballot. And they're doing that in very odd and disturbing ways. You remember this, of course. There is no Secret Service protection for third-party candidates, including RFK Jr. Now, the RFK Jr. situation, I, I'm not a fan of RFK Jr. really at all, even though there's a couple things I, I agree with him on. But generally speaking, I'm not a fan of the guy. He's left-wing. I do not want him to be president. I think he would be a very bad president. Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, We've gone over that a million times. I, I'll, I'll end my rant there. But I will say, you know, pretty much every single person in the Kennedy family has either been assassinated or, uh, you know, w- w- they attempted to assassinate them uh, or are in j- is in jail for crimes that they committed. One of those three categories is essentially every single Kennedy. Why would you not protect him? Well, RFK Jr. had been denied protection at least three times going back months now. Why? Why wouldn't you? Why? Well, they are very scared at the effects of RFK Jr. I, I mean, I... I can't defend it. There's nothing to defend here um, uh, for Biden. It's a terrible, terrible thing that he's done with RFK Jr. And I hope it does. I just hope he doesn't get burned by it. And I hope RFK doesn't get burned by it because God forbid, God forbid. We we know the history of this family. But there's it's not just RFK Jr. on the third party uh, side of things. They are trying to remove third party candidates from ballots across the country. I'm not I'm talking about RFK Jr., but not just RFK Jr. I'm talking about Jill Stein. I'm talking about Cornell West. I'm talking about a potential no labels candidacy. All of these people may take some votes from the left. And, you know, people like Jill Stein aren't going to get a high percentage of the vote. 
but they're going after them anyway. Democrats sound alarm and take action against Biden's third party threats. They are threatening these candidates. If you have any skeleton in your closet whatsoever, we're going to find it. We're going to expose it. We're going to make your life miserable because, again, this isn't someone who I mean, like, what is democracy? What is choice when you're not uh, letting third party uh, candidates on the ballot? You're removing choice from people. You're not adding it. You're trying to take off even the second party candidate off the ballot. You want no choice whatsoever, but you're the bastion of democracy. How can that possibly be? Um, We'll go back even farther. Joe Biden, a weak president, thinking about running for election, re-election at 78 years old. There's a possibility, you know, maybe Gavin Newsom runs, jumps in the race. Maybe, uh, uh, you know, some other candidate uh, with some prospects, Josh Shapiro or uh, Gretchen Whitmer or somebody jumps in the race. Eh, Well, they made sure that that was not going to happen. They changed uh, or canceled primary elections. So only Biden gets the votes. You remember this, of course. They started with Democrats voting to change the order of the 2024 presidential primary. Remember the 2020 presidential primary. Biden got smoked in all those early states. New Hampshire, uh, Iowa. He lost in Nevada. Uh, He uh, did not do well. His saving grace was South Carolina. So what did they do? Did they try to look for an honest contest in those early states? No, they just made South Carolina first. So Joe Biden went out and won easily and they knew he would win easily and then he didn't have to worry about it. Again, just another aspect of this. This is not the only thing they've done. They've tried very hard. They, of course, avoided debates with these uh, primary challengers, including RFK Jr. when he was running as a Democrat. And it's all in. I mean, you tell me, it certainly seems like appearances are that Joe Biden will at least consider not debating Trump. And you kind of almost wonder why. You go back to the Arizona gubernatorial uh, election from this past term where Carrie Lake lost. I mean, maybe one of the reasons she lost is because, I don't know, her opponent, Hobbs, would not even debate her. We're now at a point where uh, you don't have to do debates in in primaries. And look, you, you might be saying, well, what about Donald Trump? He didn't do debates. Yeah, I was critical of that too. I think that's bad. In fact, I think there should be a requirement for party nominees to have to participate in the the debates. We ask them to do all sorts of different things uh, on both sides, whether, you know, whether it's, um, you know, going to the convention, making a convention speech, uh, gathering a certain amount of signatures, uh, you know, raising a certain amount of money. All these things are requirements for these candidates. Participating in the debates should be one of them. If you can't participate in the debates, then you don't get the nomination. That's an easy thing uh, to to put in place. It's not going to affect this election, but it should be in place for next election in my view. Uh, Finally, um, how about uh, taking the people who are critical of you and throwing them in jail? Uh, Steve Baker is a prime example of this. He, of course, was uh, released from the courthouse after his January 6th reporting. He was inside the Capitol on January 6th reporting. We have released every single minute and inch of him inside the Capitol. There's no point where he is beating a police officer with a flagpole or breaking a window. He walked through an open door and took footage of the event just like Everybody else who was a journalist, Uh, in fact, journalists from The New York Times who were in who went through broken windows and went in before Steve Baker was even in the building. They're not getting charges against them. Just the fact that Steve Baker, who's critical of the White House, critical of the the stuff they've done uh, following January 6th, those people are getting thrown in jail. Is that right? I mean, think about that. Do we have the full list by any chance altogether? Look at all these things together. Look at the the five steps uh, that go go through this. I mean, you know, you jail and you bankrupt your opponent. There, you don't give any Secret Service protection for RFK Jr. You remove third-party candidates from ballots across the country and attempt to destroy their lives. You cancel or change primary elections so only your guy can get votes. And when journalists are skeptical of you, when journalists are critical of you, you throw them in prison too. Well, that makes life kind of easy, doesn't it? It also makes life like you know easy like it is for Vladimir Putin, for example, who also just had an election with basically no opponents. Is this what we're shooting for here? You know, the left acts like January 6th is the biggest uh, attack ever on democracy. But is it? Which one seriously is threatening democracy more? What if we had what if they were successful here? What if RFK Jr. and, and, and Cornell West and Jill Stein all got thrown off these ballots and they couldn't participate in this election? And what if so did Donald Trump? What if Joe Biden was up there running basically unopposed? Would that be better for democracy? What would be more of a threat to democracy, that situation or January 6th, which was a bad event by my recollection and probably yours as well, but also something that basically delayed our system four or five hours? 
Which one was more serious as a threat to democracy? I think that one's pretty easy. They keep saying they want to save democracy, but along the way, this saving looks a lot like destroying over and over and over again. I mean, you have the no uh, social security or secret service, excuse me, protection for uh, for RFK Jr. I mean, just that in itself is inexplicable. Try if you're going to be the party of democracy, try not to do, you know, all of the fascist things. Try to skip some of them, you know, look at the playbook and maybe skip around, bounce around it a little bit, because right now it's 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 too, too obvious. And I ask you this and this is like the most uh, the lowest level of punditry here, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Imagine if Donald Trump was doing all this stuff. Imagine if Donald Trump, I mean, we can't have to really imagine too much when he was on stage just getting uh, his crowds to chant, lock her up, and which was you know, pretty obviously a joke as evidenced by the fact that he became president and didn't lock her up. I mean, uh, you remember how the media reacted to just him saying it, let alone them actually doing it. They got multiple ch- cases going on all across the country to actually do it this time. The media was uh, insane with their hatred for Donald Trump for just suggesting the idea. That's not what we do in our country. That, that's banana republic nonsense. We can't do that. This is kind of a major issue. Am I right on that? I, I just It is a little too Putin-esque uh, for my particular taste. And I'm not, I mean, what is Jill Stein going to get, 1%? Is Jill Stein going to get 1% in this election? I will be surprised if she clears 1%. I will be very surprised if she clears 1% of the vote in this country. And they're out there targeting her, a person you probably never even heard of unless you're a total nerd. And the last part of this is, where are the journalists? Why are we left to bring this up? Why don't they look at this and say, by the way, we should acknowledge this is a really questionable look for the Department of Justice being controlled by one candidate and trying to throw the other candidate in prison. I understand, like, I think it's really bad that he held those documents in a bathroom. I mean, I think that's, we should maybe consider throwing him in the gulag for that, but still, it is, we should at least acknowledge the fact that this looks bad. No? Is there no journalist who will step up and just say, hey, like, guys, while some of this stuff might even be legitimate on Donald Trump, like, Maybe if we care about democracy so much, we should let the people actually decide, right? That's what democracy is. I mean, it was a step away from the old system where somebody at the top made the decisions about what was important and what wasn't. When you have an opportunity in November to vote on this specific thing, is this guy legitimate? Should he be allowed in the White House again? Why not utilize it? Why not allow people to make the decision themselves? Why take that away from them? And if you, I got to say, if you're living life and you're looking at the future of our country and saying, hey, the best way to create more hope and promise in democracy is to basically cancel the election and throw our opponent in prison. If that's the way you're thinking, you're doing life wrong. When you stroll through your grocery store's meat aisle, do you really know where that meat's coming from? Uh, A lot of the meat is imported from, you know, who knows where. Uh, And that is, uh, even if it has a product of the USA sticker, that just means it was packaged here. That doesn't mean it was raised here. But there is a solution, Backyard Butchers. This is a Christian, Texas-based company that is dedicated uh, to delivering the best deals on high-quality American-raised beef. You don't have to worry about mystery meat being in there. You just get old-fashioned beef from the heartland of America. And right now, you can go to BackyardButchers.com slash stew. BackyardButchers.com slash stew. Use the code stew. You'll save an extra 20% off your entire order. When you subscribe, you'll get an additional 10% off and free shipping. Uh, It's free shipping, which is, uh, you know, it's a big deal when it comes to, I mean, if you're ordering, like, enough for, like, you know, the Jeffy, uh, the Jeffies in your family, like 19 stacks of steak for every single person. Shipping could get expensive, so you want to save on shipping. Uh, cut out the frustration from the meat aisle and support America, American farmers with Backyard Butchers. You can head over to BackyardButchers.com slash stew and order your box of American raised beef today. It's at BackyardButchers.com slash stew. 
I'm joined now by Brandon Morse. He's senior editor at Red State and host of Brandon Morse is a brand risk, which you don't normally want to say about yourself, but <laughs> it seems to be working out very well. He's over on Rumble. Uh, Brandon, how's it going? Uh, not bad at all, man. Good yeah. to be here. Bla Blaze alum. Uh, yes. You know, gone into great things at Red State, your own podcast and all this. It's, yeah. It's, congratulations for all Thank your success. Thank you so much. Yeah. And since I've been, I've, I got married, I had a kid. Jeez. Yeah, I know. I've just been that really busy. That too. I mean, the podcast <laughs> is obviously the big attraction, for but sure, the marriage yeah. and the kid is nice too. So yeah, congratulations. Yeah. It's great to hear that everything's <laughs> going well. I, I wanted to bring you in because you kind of have a, an interesting window into a community that I don't really have a great sense of, which is the gaming community. Yeah. And, you know, I, as a kid, grew up playing tons and tons of games. Uh, you know, I'll still dive in for a little Madden or MLB The Show here and there, but, like, I'm not as involved in the day-to-day -day and all the developments. And there was sort of a, a, a I don't know, a, a little bit of a... Uh, an interesting controversy on the right recently as to whether the gaming industry is as crazy as so many other industries <laughs> seem to be. And, like, I think, you know, you point this out in one of your articles, uh, the gaming industry is conservative movement's best friend. It just doesn't know it yet. And you point out that, like, there's some truth. To, there's some crazy elements of the gaming industry. But maybe that's not the right way for conservatives to think about it. No. I mean, for a long time, conservatives have been told that, you know, gaming rots your brain. You know, people become obsessed and addicted. And, you know, it's just full of nonsense and horrible things. You know, they're often, you know, they use GTA as a, you know, Grand Theft Auto sure, yeah. as an example of why people shouldn't play video games at all. But I would argue that the gaming industry is actually so much deeper than, than many people, especially conservatives, tend to understand. Um, gaming, especially the gaming subculture, is probably one of the largest in the world and it encompasses so many types of people, religious, races, nationalities. Um, and what's funny is that gaming has the ability to bring all these people together in ways that many other subcultures don't. They just can't. Um, and it's one of the reasons why, you know, conservatives should really pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the radical left has infiltrated nearly everything. Um, you know, especially entertainment wise, but the one thing that they haven't been able to fully conquer is the gaming industry because gamers largely do not allow it to happen. Yeah. Um, now you could say, yeah, you know, many of the corporate studios have become very woke, like many corporate things have, but the gaming industry is so large that there is a thriving indie industry mm. that sometimes even eclipses the major gaming industry and the gamers in particular are very used to going out and wanting to have fun, find that escapism. So whenever they are actually preached at or told you know, that they're horrible, whatever, they take their business, they go to the indie industry to actually pick up a game that is actually fun. Yeah. And you know, the, the woke corporate industry tends to falter and fail. Mm. You see it happening right now with you know, Sweet Baby Inc., you know, it was, which has infected the corporate, corporate woke industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a movement, type Gamergate 2 right now, yeah. that is currently making many developers regret ever wanting to work with Sweet Baby Inc. Uh, because they wokeify their games, they make them mm. not as fun, not cool, and, and gamers walk away and they go and they play something like Helldivers 2, which is an independent studio created game from a Swedish studio called Arrowhead Studios, and it's become something of a cultural sensation. So when it comes to video games, the woke left is actually fighting on the back foot. Mm. You mentioned Gamergate 2. Let's go back to Gamergate 1, yeah. because this actually, it's probably a term that people, if you're online, you've seen this term around, you don't really know what the hell it is. Yeah. Um, but it kind of was a precursor to a lot of the cultural battles yes. that we wound up fighting. Can you go back and explain this to if they don't remember it? So Gamergate 1 is probably one of the largest losses the left, the radical left has ever taken. Mm. Um, it began because gamers simply wanted ethics in gaming journalism. That's really what they asked for. And the gaming journalists said, no, you are going to be preached at. We're going to tell you that you're racist and homophobic, and we're going to try to influence all these studios into becoming woke themselves. Um, and Gamergate ended up being a, a consumer revolt is what it was. Mm. And one that actually cost the gaming industry and many of the, uh, I should say the corporate gaming industry, and many of the woke journalist outlets uh, a lot of money. Some of them closed down. In fact, one of them is on the verge of closing down right now. One of the more popular ones called Kotaku. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah you've heard of that. Yeah. Uh, Kotaku is, is on death's door right now because... You know, back then, uh, in 2014, when the first Gamergate started, they said... We are, gamers are no longer our audience. You know, they're embarrassing, they're horrible. And we said, okay, 
and we left. Huh. So there's no one around reading them anymore. And then, then they gave that advice to Bud Light and try to get them. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, they're like, oh, well, let's hire those guys. Can you believe that? <laughs> um, but it seems like when you call your audience hicks and rubes, exactly. and they don't seem to like it all that much, which is kind of weird. Yeah, no, it is kind of weird. I think that they expected uh, to steamroll a lot of us. Um, you know, the, uh, there's a YouTuber named Razor Fist, and he brought up a really good point. You know, the the... Marxist left has been wanting to overtake everything entertainment, but for a very long time, they overlooked the gaming industry because it just, you know, it was, for, it was a toy for kids, you know, they right. didn't have to worry about that. Yeah. Uh, then soon, gaming actually overtook movies, it overtook music. In fact, the music and mu movie industries combined can't hold a candle to what the gaming industry earns. So now it's a cultural force unto itself that the radical left is late to the party on. And because of that, it has not been able to infect a lot of minds. Uh, gamers are one of the last bastions of, I would say, real intellectual ideological independence. Mm. That's, I mean, it, it, for that reason, I mean, you have a lot of people who are voting, you have a lot of people who have political influence. All this ties back to the th issues we talk about every day. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, and, and this is why you know, many conservatives need to understand and see gamers for what they are. You know, I mean, these are people who slay dragons as a hobby. You know, <laughs> they fight and they fight. And whenever they lose, they press continue and they fight more, mm -hmm. you know. And that's one of the reasons that they are not being overcome by this I mean, amalgamation of, of woke corporate, you know, journalistic nonsense, this access media that keeps trying to tilt everything in their favor and, and introduce their ideology, and they're just not succeeding well. Mm. And it's because gamers fight, and they fight hard. How do you look at the state of our culture generally in the United States right now? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, generally, I would say that it is in a bad state, but I can't say that it's going to stay that way forever. I think that there is, the pendulum is starting to swing the other way. Mm. Um, you can kind of see that right now in the way that various studios are faltering and failing and trying to recoup uh, by changing course a little bit. Um, there are currently wars happening. Uh, I would say Disney is a very good example of this. Right now, uh, Nelson Peltz is trying to restore the magic. That's his movement right now. Uh, by getting him and one other guy on the Disney board, Disney is trying to stop that from happening. The vote happens on April 3rd. Uh, but it looks like more and more people, stockholders specifically, are kind of gearing themselves up to vote for Peltz. And if Peltz takes over with Trian Partners uh, and, and gets on the board, they can really make some really great changes for Disney. And that, I think, is a sign, going to be a big sign of a turn in the culture, uh, a turn of, in the entertainment culture of going from this destructive ideological extreme extremism to something more American, I would say. Yeah, I mean, because I think one of the, I was thinking about this when you go back and you watch like old school uh, commercials from like the 80s and the 90s. Yeah. And, and you see like, you know, it's quality is job one, right? Like right. It, there's almost this obsessive focus on quality. Like they make the people at the factories like they've got no other life. They don't care about their families. <laughs> they don't care about the, they don't care about politics. All they care about is making this machine the best possible. All they care about is their customers. Yeah. And like there's been a real reversal of that over right. time where it's now like, well, we don't really care about what you're doing. We, what we care about is this a higher ideological right. concept. And I mean, a lot of that's just, you know, BS marketing. But like the mar the change in marketing is real. Like it's yes. it's it's. I don't know if they think this is working on people, but continually uh, as we watch this process play out, it feels like uh, they're realizing the opposite is true. I mean, Boeing yes. is a good example of that. Where he's like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Focus on your planes. Yeah. No, there was actually. It's funny that you mentioned Boeing because there was a recent article on Fox News that said that uh, many customers who book on Kayak and websites like that, there's an option that you can say what kind of plane do you want to fly on, and they are not clicking on oh, Boeing, wow. they are clicking off of it because mm. they're scared. Yeah. They don't want to get on Boeing planes anymore because of DEI and ESG. Now, you mentioned the marketing and stuff. A lot of it is virtue signaling because they want to be seen being the good guy. Mm. But some of this is forced. You know, you have companies like BlackRock attempting to uh, force many companies into obeying certain, or checking certain boxes, you know, for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you get Dylan Mulvaney trying to pimp Bud Light, right. you know. Uh, and it's backfiring in a big way for many reasons, not just Boeing, Bud Light. Many other companies are having to suffer from that, too. And so I think that the more customers actually revolt, the more that uh, eventually, you know, they're going to be forced to withdraw from these ESG, DEI ideas. 
and actually go back to what you mentioned earlier, which was the let's focus on making the best product. Because yeah. really, ultimately, that's only that's the only thing that matters. Yeah. You don't need to be seen. I don't I don't go to the store and check, you know, whether or not, you know, a company is supporting my favorite cause. You know, I don't go and buy, uh, you know, uh, an apple and think, man, I really hope the person who grew this apple right. really <laughs> loves high speed rail. You know, <laughs> it's dumb. I just want an apple, man. <laughs> you know, that's it. And I think that we're going to get there. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's it's Jennifer Say calls it normie capitalism. Yes. And, I, and that's what I want. I just yes. want the normie capitalism that we grew up with, at least. Yeah. Let me be weird on my terms. Yes, exactly. You know? um, it, uh, it was interesting. I was watching. Um, uh, I mentioned the story once before, but I, we were, I was watching the r- most recent Ricky Gervais special yes. on Netflix. And Ricky Gervais is really funny. He's always really funny. The special was really funny. Yeah. But what was interesting, it was the first time I remember watching someone on a primetime outlet like that uh, on Netflix yeah. uh, doing something that was anti-woke. And it didn't quite feel dangerous to me anymore. Like, yeah. it didn't feel like, oh, this guy's going to get canceled tomorrow. This guy's going to get blown out. Now, he's Ricky Gervais. He kind of has a lot of leeway. Right. But, like, I do feel like that pendulum is coming back at least a little bit. Where are we in that process? I mean, yeah, I think the pendulum is, I would say, on the upswing now, coming out from the middle of it. Because, like you just said, like, remember when Dave Chappelle released that yeah. comedy special and it, everyone just went nuts? Mm-hmm. I mean, that was something that we are, back then was shocking. Now it's not. Now Ricky Gervais says it. And, you know, I remember reading some articles saying, yeah, it was funny. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. It wasn't shocking anymore. That wasn't, wasn't really the moment. You know, the shocking part wasn't the, the big part. Um, and, and you kind of also see this in the gaming industry. Now games are being released. And uh, there is a guy who created a, a curation list on Steam, which is a, a, a games marketplace. And on that curation list, he actually puts, his name is Cabrutus Rambo, he's, he's from Brazil. Uh, he puts on games that were created with the help of Sweet Baby Inc. And now that he has that curation list, which now has over 330,000 people on it, you'll see companies now going to Cabrutus Rambo and be like, hey, yeah, we did work with them in the past, we're not anymore. Please take us off this right. list. They don't want to be associated with that ESG, DEI nonsense, with that leftist nonsense. So, yeah, it's coming up now. Mm. People are walking away. And that's really great for our culture because I, I really think that if we're going to get back to normalcy of any kind, the culture first has to change. But, you know, maybe it has to get a little worse before it gets better. But, I mean, I, I see better on the horizon. Mm. I've seen uh, the Sweet Baby Inc. included in some of the commentary on this. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Because I don't know much about them, but they, they, they're a game maker that just does a lot of woke stuff? Or? So what they are is um, whenever, <laughs> they're kind of like the mob. <laughs> okay. Like the mob. <laughs> okay. They go in and they're like, oh, I see you've got a nice studio here. It'd be a real shame if mm. someone canceled it. Ah. Uh, so what We're they, very familiar here at The Blaze with, with, those, yes, with those types of yes. things. Yeah. Um, so basically what Sweet Baby Inc. is is an advisory company. Okay. And they go into studios that are making games and they say, all right, uh, let me take a look at your, and by the way, they're usually hired either by force or because the developers themselves have that woke ideology. And they'll go in and they'll say, I don't like this character. We need to race swap or change them up so that, you know, uh, race swap, gender swap, whatever it takes to make them fit more of the woke ideology that we have. They'll change up storylines. They'll change up dialogue um, until it is basically a, a bunch of checked boxes, a bunch of checked boxes for the woke left. And, you know, the bad thing about that, like, you know, obeying woke ideology when it comes to entertainment is that it all starts to look the same after a while. And, and it, the stories don't make sense after a while, or they're just kind of like annoyingly stupid, you know? Yeah. Uh, they're not deep anymore. They don't really have substance. And that's why, you know, Sweet Baby, that's what Sweet Baby Inc. does, though, is they introduce that, uh, that checkbox nonsense and uh, ruin games. And that's one of the reasons why gaming companies are now saying, mm, no, we don't want this. We saw what happened to uh, to to remedy with uh, Alan Wake 2. We saw what happened to Kill the Justice League. All Sweet Baby ga- games that they worked on and ruined. Mm. And and they could have been they could have been great probably. They probably at one point one time were great. Yeah, as a gamer too, you're going there for like the the most extreme experience, right? Like you want the most powerful weapon. You don't want some moderate weapon. You don't want it watered down. I'm just going there for good escapism. Yeah. That's really what it boils down to. I'm just going there to have a good time. Mm-hmm. 
I'm not coming there to be preached at. Right. I'm not going to pay $60 so you can tell me that I'm a homophobe. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. that's not what I'm here for. So, yeah. I'll do it for $40. Exactly. I'll call you a homophobe exactly. over and over again for $49.99. <laughs> no problem. Uh, Brandon Morse, senior editor at Red State. Uh, be sure to uh, check out his show. Brandon Morse is a brand risk over on Rumble. Brandon, great to see you, man. Thanks hey, so much man. for coming Thanks on. for having me, brother. Well, if you happen to be watching the news this weekend um, or popped on social media, you probably saw some of the really horrific video of an awful event in Moscow where terrorists attacked a concert venue in sort of a mall uh, situation. Uh, and it was over 130 people were killed, uh, many more injured. I mean, it was a really, really bad one. And, uh, of course, you know, there's a few things that are we can kind of talk about here that are true and necessary. Uh, number one, obviously, just the loss of life, uh, terrible, and you know we feel for all the families that are affected by this. Um, and, you know, and you know, obviously, we're not hugely uh, aligned with Russia, right? Like, you know, we haven't had a great relationship, uh, particularly recently. But it is important to separate the uh, actions of the government uh, from innocent people going to a freaking concert, right? Like, this is completely insane. And of all the really bad things you can say about the Russian uh, leadership, and many of those things are very, very much true. Even with the Russian leadership, I still prefer Russia to ISIS. Uh, that is, uh, there's not a close call uh, there at all for me. It might be for you, uh, but not really a close call for me on that one. Uh, Russia obviously has done some things I do not like at all, but ISIS is still there. It's still around. These people still exist. They don't go away. And the, uh, the fact that they are still murdering people for absolutely no reason, uh, no coherent reason, is, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's shocking that it's, it's still going on. One reason why you don't just cede, let's say, an entire country to people who've been aligned with them, um, that's, a, that's a different situation. But finally, I want to just kind of hit you with this, and, and it's something I thought of as I was watching all this coverage. Uh, the, for, for the first 24 hours or so, Vladimir Putin didn't say anything after this attack happened. It's one of the worst terrorist attacks we've seen in a long time. You expect the president to be out there. But Vladdy doesn't really roll that way. He kind of sits back and waits and releases a video statement. And, and, and the video statement comes out, and it's not really notable. I mean, he didn't mention ISIS at all, which, of course, Americans are saying uh, they uh, you know, had information on a potential ISIS attack on concert venues in Moscow. They said this publicly beforehand. And then it wound up happening uh, in Moscow. And the fact that he didn't mention that is not a good sign. And the reason I say that is because think about how close we are to World War III right now. And you might say, well, how close, how, how close are we? Well, if his statement comes out and says it was Ukraine that was responsible, which he sort of hinted at, and that American uh, forces helped along on this. Let's just say they made that up completely, but they say that to their people. We're pretty much in World War III. Like right now, the line between us and World War III is Vladimir Putin's restraint. Does that make you feel good? It doesn't make me feel good. I'd rather be there to have be a lot of lies. This is why you need to be really careful with the things you do. It would be a lot more uh, implausible to people if the random ISIS attack happened and, and the United States was supposedly folded into it. The fact that we are working uh, so closely and publicly with Ukraine and uh, saying, yes, we're giving them millions and millions and millions of dollars of weapons to fire at Russians in the battlefield, while that might seem plausible and, and makes a lot of sense for pe people here in America, you have to understand how Russian people would see that, maybe not so friendly uh, as, a, as a situation. So, I mean, I just you know, hope and pray that we don't have to go through something terrible like that, because I am concerned about how close we are to it. Uh, and I also want to take a minute to look back four years ago. It's our four-year anniversary of Andrew Cuomo's killing spree. Yes, uh, it's true. When he came out and said, hey, you know what we should do is import COVID positive patients into nursing homes. Yes, only four years ago that actually was going on. That was actually a real thing. And it did wind up killing a bunch of people. The Empire Center has a report looking back at, you know, what we can learn from all that that is worth your time. I mean, one of the things you can learn from it is not putting Andrew Cuomo in power ever again. And I should remind you of this in case you don't happen to know. Andrew Cuomo is awful.com. Yes, that's true. It's still up. And we were actually looking at this today. 
Our best-selling merchandise from the beginning of the show, well, the best one is uh, the Nancy Pelosi Sucks pen. Okay, that's the best one. But they're out of print. They're, we no longer have any more of those, so they're no longer on the site. But the best-selling item since the beginning of the site is the Andrew Cuomo is awful.com mug. So if you want to celebrate the fact that he's still not the governor of New York, feel free to go to Andrew Cuomo is awful.com. I mean, I suppose it would be great if anytime you needed medication, you could actually just go to the pharmacy and get it. But that just seems too easy, doesn't it? You know, right now we're in a situation where there's all sorts of problems with our manufacturing of medications. You know, China does a lot of this manufacturing for us. And when drug shortages appear, uh, they're the ones handling our problems, not us. Not ideal. Not ideal. Suboptimal, as they say. Uh, you want to uh, have the ability to take care of your family's health. You want to find whatever the situation, preparation as a, as a prominent part of your plan. You need the Jace case. This is a personalized emergency kit that contains five essential antibiotics that treat the most common and deadly bacterial infections. Jace is uh, always adding uh, the medications that uh, you can add as options to the Jace case. Uh, you, there's got a ton of them. Go check out. See what you and your family think is important. Plus, you can buy a gift card for your family or loved ones so that they can get a Jace case of their own and personalize it to their needs. Everyone should be empowered to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. You can get yours today at jacemedical.com, J-A-S-E medical.com. You can enter the code STU at checkout, and you'll get a discount on your order right now. Go to jacemedical.com, J-A-S-E medical.com. The promo code is STU. Well, apparently there's a new option for you if you're not satisfied with the slew of candidates. I mean, I feel like there's more third party candidates that have made noise in this election than any I can remember in a long time. I mean, you know, obviously RFK Jr. is out polling most third party candidates. Uh, and then you still have a lot of these like, people like Cornell West, who are well-known figures uh, running. And of course, the no label stuff, who knows what's going to go on with that? Well, a North Texas man has changed his name to literally anybody else and now is running for president. So if... <laughs> If you think about what it would look like on your ballot, you'd have like Donald Trump, Joe Biden, Cornell West, RFK Jr., and then literally anybody else. And I think a lot of people might just click, you know, hey, literally anybody else. I, I don't like these people. Um, <laughs> it's very possible he might get some votes. Now, whether you, it's really hard to get on ballots and who knows what's going to happen with that. But he's going for it. He's, he's apparently um, going to try to get 113,151 signatures to get on uh, the Texas ballot. I don't know what his actual plan is, if he just thinks it's funny or if he's trying to push one, uh, the state one way or the other. Either way, it's kind of a good gimmick, though someone should t- I, it should be uh, uh, illegal to change your name and then change it back. I, so he, I think he should have to stay literally anybody else for at least like a year as punishment. Okay, so here's what happened. We all know when you go skiing, you know, you're on frozen water going down a hill on two pieces of, you know, fiberglass at very high speeds. There's a good chance, you know, you're going to die. And then if you think about rodeo, kind of the same thing. Like you're not in, it's not as cold, which is nice. But you're trying to tame some of the most you know, powerful beasts in the wild, you're doing all these crazy things, and there's a good chance you're going to die. What would happen if you combined both skiing and rodeo? Yes, that's the sport of ski joring, I guess it's called. Uh, the wild and wacky sport of ski joring. Uh, it looks freaking terrifying. Uh, watch this video. Holy crap. Something like 40 miles an hour behind a horse. There's just a rope you're hanging on to, like, sort of like uh, water skiing behind a horse almost, and you're going over jumps at 30 to 40 miles an hour. And that looks absolutely terrifying. I don't recommend it at all, unless you're actually trying to die. All right, we'll see you tomorrow.